Hi, so in the last class I talked about Joule Thomson expansion process or Joule Thom Thomson uh, throttling and I told that Joule Thomson expansion coefficient for uh, ideal gases is zero. But there is this process called reversible adaptive expansion that you will often come across, right? That is something that is used um, in different heat engines. Although heat engines uh, may not seem very, very important for non uh, materials, but it is very important to understand these adaptive processes because you have adaptive processes, isothermal processes, isochoric processes, um, isobaric processes, and here we are talking about adaptive processes. And uh, when a gas expands uh, in an adaptive process, uh, what really happens, right? How does the temperature relate to the volume, etc. Et so you see. When you have reversible adaptive expansion, reversible means that it is the process is infinitesimally slow and basically you can plot it on a PV curve. Say for example, if I have a PV curve, if I have a PV curve, then I can, so say for example, this is pressure, volume, then you can basically Ah, some sort of a curve like this. And it is represented. This, this curve basically uh, uh, tells me that some something is like we would the bar bump. Say, for example, this curve, curve is like P V P V to the power gamma goes to constant. Now, what is this gamma? Right, so and uh, how to determine this gamma? So for that, so th say for example, this is the equation of an adaptive process or a reversible adaptive expansion of an ideal gas. So of let us consider first an ideal gas of an ideal gas. So as soon as I tell ideal gas, what comes in my a uh, constitutive uh, uh, a state relation ah. Uh, a relation between the states, an equation of state that is called an equation of state. Whether it is an ideal gas or a real gas, uh, for example, Van der Waals equation of state, you will see in one of the assignments, I have talked about Van der Waals equation of state. So, equations of state basically relate the, in general, it relates the uh, intensive variables and extensive variables. Say, for example, for ideal gas, the simplest equation of state that we know for quite some time is PV equals to N R T, where N is the number of moles, P is the external, P is the pressure, V is volume, R is universal gas constant, and T is temperature. Now, when I talk about adaptive process then or adaptive expansion, then first thing that comes in mind is that delta Q has to be equal to 0. As you can see here, that I have noted here, that delta Q is going to be 0, right, for an adaptive, because the process is adaptive, right, because it does not allow any heat exchange between the system and the surroundings, right. Now, delta Q equal to 0, delta W equals to minus PdV, and this is something that, this is delta, again, this is reversible mechanical work, which is minus PdV. Whether work is done by the system or work is done on the system, based on our on convention of uh, work done on the system is positive, delta W. So, whether it is by the system or on the system, delta W is always minus PD, right. So, in one case, for example, if it is on the system, P basically is the external pressure, denotes the external pressure and dV denotes the decrease in volume, right. So, that is negative. So, that is why I put a negative sign. On the other hand, when you tell that work is done by the system, the gas is expanding against some pressure. So, if it is against some pressure, again, the internal pressure is like minus P and minus P into dV, where dV is positive, right. So, in both cases, the equation is minus PD, right, it is force displacement relation. And then, you have also change in internal energy of the gas that is expanding, which you can write as CV, CV is the heat capacity at constant volume dt, right, this is heat capacity at constant volume. Remember, this is not the heat capacity, molar heat capacity, but it is the total heat capacity at constant volume for some n, n moles, 
Now, if it is so, according to first law, now if I use first law, next page, if I use first law, then we can directly write du equals to delta q plus delta w. Again, by delta, delta is because it's path function and this is all reversible. Let us write delta q rare, delta w rare, and this is c v d p, and this is 0 and minus p p v. Now the equation of state is p v equals to say n r t. Now therefore p I can write as n r t by v. And see, P is not, so, so instead of P, I am substituting as NRT by V and P is the external pressure or the internal pressure, which is then we can write CVDT equals to minus NRT dV by V. Or we can also write further CV dt by t, I am taking t this side, I am taking this t this side, so it becomes cv dt by t equals to minus nr dv by v. Now I can integrate, so I am integrating and say I tell that initial temperature was ti, final temperature is tf and similarly it is vi and v f then what do i get i get c v ln t f by p i equals to minus n r ln v f by v i or i can write as n r ln I put the minus sign, so Vf Vi by Vi to the power minus 1, right? So, this is basically ln Vi by Now, we will continue with this relation. So, Cv, now we can write Nr by Cv. So, basically what we can write is ln ln Tf by Ti equals to, let us put some number, Nr minus Nr or Nr by Cv. Okay, nr by cv. So here, uh, this is nr by cv and then vi by t. Okay, so now this nr by cv, as you can see, n is the number of moles constant. Uh, let us assume it to be constant, it doesn't change it. And r is gas constant and cv is the molar capacity. Obviously, it can be a function of temperature. It CV can be a function of temperature, but if you have, we can also assume it to be a constant. Now, in such a case, what you have? You have this, right? You got this CV and NTF by VI plus minus NTF by VI, which is basically NR and VI by V. Now, what you are writing is chi. See, I can also write it as gamma. Some, some, uh, some textbooks use gamma. I prefer to use the word chi. Right, because I don't want to confuse gamma with something else. So uh, later, so I use our chi, uh, the symbol chi, and sometimes people do use gamma. It's like new. I'm very sorry for this. Let us call it gamma. Okay, and equal to CV. Um, you know. So in our in, in here we will call it as chi. Let's call it chi. Now, uh, so if if you see that. So, Cv by Nr, so Nr by Cv, so I, I just write Cv by Nr, ln Tf by Ti equals to ln Vi by Vf. Now, see, this can be written as Tf by Ti equal to Vi by Vf. Whole to the power Cv by Nr. 
Now this CV by NR I am replacing by the CV by NR that is there in the superscript. It is there in the superscript here. The CV by NR I am uh, I am replacing it by gamma, the symbol gamma or the symbol chi. One of them. So I am using here chi for example. As you can see here chi. And then what happens? TF by TI. So am I correct? Uh, this is not correct. This has to be TF by TI all to the power TF by TI all to the power CV by NR equals to VI by VF or you can write as TF by TI equals to VI by VF all to the power the ultra thing, that is nr by c nr by c right this is also possible so uh, both ways we can write so this is cv by nr the way i have taken is see, nr by cv i took here so this one this branch came from this and this one is following from this way of rearrange right so both ways we can write. So let us follow one of the ways and see. So you have chi L M T F by T I C V by N R. So basically here is C V by N R, and here you have V I by V F. So T F by T I to the power chi, right? Where chi equal to C V by N R is equal to V I by V F, or T F by T I equals to V I by V F for one by chi, right? It is one by chi. Because if you see, this is CV by NR, if it's on the left hand side, if it's on the right hand side, it is NR by CV, right? It has to be NR by CV because what I'll do here, I will use this expression. When I put, put NR by CV on the, NR by CV on the right hand side, then NR by CV, so VI by VA for call NR by CV and or if I put it on the left hand side then it becomes CV by N, right? So both are possible and as you can see here TF by TI equal to chi equal to VI by VF you can also write as TF by TI equal to VI by VF equal to power 1 by chi. This is something that you have always done. And now you see TI by TF is VF by VI. Uh, now this is one interesting. So if I now uh, create a reciprocal of both terms on the both on both sides then uh, this is tf ti by tf is 1 by tf by ti so and this also becomes 1 by vi by vf for the power of chi so it becomes vf by vi on the power of right now yeah, so i will not call this gamma i will call gamma as so here we are calling gamma as cp by cv chi as cv by n now you see cp minus cv equal to n this is for ideal gas this we have already shown for ideal gas cp minus cv equal to n this is something that we have already proved and then we are writing gamma equal to cp by cv now this is going to see ti by tf equals to vf by vi to the power nr by cv now nr by cv you have nr here and you can see you are substituting nr you substitute nr by cp minus c so it becomes vf by vi to the power cp minus cv by c which is v, vf by vi cp by cv minus 1 which is basically Vf by Vi to the power gamma minus 1, right? So it becomes to the power gamma minus 1. Now what is the relation between chi and this? So chi equal to, look at chi equal to, let's do the other term, chi equals to Cv by n, right? Cv by Cp minus C. And which is basically Cp minus Cv by Cv whole to the power minus 1 which is equals to Cp by Cv which is gamma minus 1 
whole to the power minus 1 or which is equals to 1 by gamma minus 1. Right? So, if that is so, now another thing, Pi by Pf equals to Vf by Pi. That is something that you can also use. Right? Pi by, uh, so, if that is so, so what did I do? I have written here, it has become clumsy. So, let us look at this. Mm, yeah, so you have say Pv equals to n r t. So, if I write this way, P i v i equals to n, uh, say if I keep the past on P i and P f v f equals to n r t f. So, P i v i, therefore, I can write You can write pi vi by pf vf equals to pi by pf or you can write pi by pf equals to pf by vi into pi by pf which is basically again we have found that vf pi by pf is nothing but vf by vi to the power gamma minus 1 right vf by vi to the power gamma minus 1 now you have vf and vf to the power gamma minus 1 which gives you Vf to power gamma and Vi to power gamma. So, that means it, it basically tells you Pi by Pf equals to Vf by Vi to the power, um, uh, the power gamma. So, now if you do that, so it becomes Pi Vi to the power gamma. See, if you rearrange now, it is Pi Vi to the power gamma because Pf Vf to the power gamma, which is a constant. This is for, so basically if I write such a process, this is a process that I will use. So if I die, if I use such a process, this process, yeah, this process that you are seeing here, I will come a little back and show you that this process that I have represented here on the PV is a reversible. By the way, if it is reversible, it is not possible to put uh, this path in a PV diagonal because at each point in this path, right, at each point in this path, the System can traverse this path both ways, means it can go this way, it can go also the other way. And the way it is happening, right, at each point the, of increment, I come here, alert equilibrate, come here, so it's an infinitesimal process. But as you can see here, that for reversible adaptive expansion, the work done is PVP work. Right, so, so, so basically uh, not work done, the work done is minus PDV, but what you get is PVP power gamma. Is equal to constant. So, for a reversible adaptive expansion of an ideal gas, is it presented by an equation of state of the form P V to the power gamma equals to constant, where gamma equals to C V by C V. Remember, gamma I am using here as C V by C V at C P minus C V by C V is where I am, or N R by C V is what I am using as time. Okay, so now we know adaptive process, we know also isothermal process, we know isothermal process. For isothermal process, temperature is fixed. Isothermal temperature does not change. P is set. So they are give you Pi Vi equals to Pf. Vf equals to K. So, in one case, K1. So, K isotherm. So, let's call it. And here it is like Pi, Vi. So, Vf, Vf. Equals to, uh, you can write this P also. This is Pi, Vf equals to gamma. Equals to Pf equals to gamma. Equals to P, V, P, Gamma equals to Q. Right? Yes, yeah, so we have the two equations of uh, two equations representing isothermal and adiabatic process. Right? Isothermal for a given temperature P and adiabatic for uh, in, in case of adiabatic, what uh, am I keeping fixed? I'm keeping nothing fixed, right? Temperature is changing, your pressure can change, your volume can change, 
uh, right so basically you can uh, however if the pressure uh, yeah so pressure uh, so you have pv by t right so the relation so pressure volume temperature all constant so you can write in one case pv p bar gamma where gamma is p by c either in other case gamma there is no gamma okay now i come to a very important law it's called a the second law of thermodynamics second law of thermodynamics is very fundamental because it is not the principle of conservation of energy second law of thermodynamics does not teach you the principle of conservation of energy it teaches you directionally it tells you that there exists a property of the universe the universe is composed of system and surroundings that will change in a certain way or in a certain direction irrespective of whatever process takes place irrespective of whatever process is taking place in the universe the uh, this property called entropy will change in a certain way so for, now as you can see there are two types of processes right one is called a natural process or a spontaneous process a uh, that does not require work to be done on the system right a spontaneous process does not require any work to be done on the system so that's called a spontaneous process think of a spontaneous process here for example free expansion of a gas so you have kept a gas in a chamber so in one side of the chamber you have kept a gas in the other side you have kept vacuum or you have created a vacuum and the the, the, the chambers are separated by, by a, say a, by a, a valve and the valve is closed so that the gas cannot basically come flow from the left chamber to the right chamber so in such a case now in such a case if i open the valve what will happen there will be a free expansion of gas there is no work so gas will automatically go and fill the chamber that was having initially fact right so and it will go on filling and and you will see surprisingly that at one point of time where it has completed all so it will see you will see that the filling has happened spontaneously right it has happened spontaneously because there was no work that has to be done for this gas to flow through the open valve into the chamber that contains that this is an example of a so this free expansion so example here if i have to give then i can tell one major example that i give is free expansion of a gas okay so because there is no work required to be done for this free expansion uh, of the gas then there are also non spontaneous or artificial processes for example in a hot summer day when you run your ac the ac is cooling you but ac is also releasing a lot of hot air outside and uh, and and the work done to cool the room is non spontaneous or artificial right so there are such processes one is a natural process natural process another example of natural process i have a hot body and i have a cold body i put them and say for example i put them together you will see that there will be heat flow unless means uh, till there is an equilibrium that is all the the, the a thermal equilibrium thermal equilibrium means there will be some intermediate temperature at which both bodies will settle right so and this heat flow that will happen is again from hot body to cold body you will see later that it's a natural or a spontaneous process non spontaneous is if the heat had to be made means if we could use a mechanism to make the heat flow from the cold body to the hot body for example when i am talking about air conditioning see you have a very hot summer think of that so you have surrounding so you are sitting in a room and the surroundings is really really hot like what it is celsius inside if you do not have any air conditioning uh, your temperature also has to go towards say for example it's a, like the surrounding is everywhere is hot in celsius a huge volume of surrounding so ultimately your temper the room temperature should also settle to something like 40 degrees celsius 
right? So in contact with the surroundings. However, when the AC is running, there is some work that is done so that the cold room can reject heat and to the surrounding, which is already hot, right? The cold room can reject heat and the room remains cold because of the machine, right? So is it a colder room, uh, a cooler room? You can maintain a cooler room by doing some work, and that is where. So there is some work done, and therefore this process of air conditioning is a non-spontaneous or an artificial process. Now all these natural and spontaneous processes have some, um, or uh, spontaneous process has a direction, non-spontaneous process or artificial process has a direction. Now all these processes follow second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics again to recap is the property of the universe, and that property of the universe changes in a. In a, in a given direction, irrespective of the process that is taking place. Then it is. Now, this is very interesting. So, the way I want to define it is like that in second law, you get a state function, right? You, you define a state function called Kentrop. Now, note that in second law, you are not, in the first law, you define something called energy and you told energy is conserved. Now you are defining some sort of entropy, but you are not talking about anything about the conservation of entropy. What you are telling is that S universe or S total always increases in the direction of spontaneous states. You are telling, what we are telling is S universe or S total always increases in the direction of spontaneous change. Right? So in the direction of spontaneous change, S the S universe, a total entropy of the universe should always change in the direction of spontaneous change. So, delta S universe has to be greater than 0 for any spontaneous change. Now, as you can see, if I look at delta S, it is like a uh, macroscopic change, a change that is measurable and DS is an infinite symmetry. So, often as you have seen previously, delta will be used for a macro change and means a measurable change and D for uh, infinite symbol changes in the entropy. Now, think of this. There is, as I told you, that there is a delta S universe, right? There is a delta S. And it is always greater than 0 for a Natural process. Right? And we are telling now that this delta S universe or delta S uh, universe is a sum of delta S system, right? There is delta S universe, you can write as delta S system plus delta S surroundings, right? So it is delta S system plus delta S surroundings, let's call it delta S surroundings. So it's like I just write SUR. So SUR basically denotes surroundings. However, for each case, what we are telling, for each each part of the universe, that is system part of the universe, that is the system is the part that we will be focusing on, or the surroundings part of the universe can be divided into two further terms. One is called entropy transfer between the system and the surroundings because of the heat transfer that happens between the system and the surroundings. There is something called an entropy or a state function of entropy that transfers between the system and the surroundings, and we call it delta S T, small t. Delta S uh, with a subscript of small t basically denotes the entropy transfer between the system and surroundings because of exchange of heat between the system and the surroundings. However, there is another term which is called delta S P, which is our delta entropy production term. And this entropy production term is always going to be greater than zero uh, as long as the process is spon uh, spontaneous or natural. Um, the delta S production can go to uh, is always going to be positive or it can also be equal to 0 but it cannot be negative. On the other hand, delta S transfer can have any sign. Delta S production is always going to be either positive for natural or spontaneous processes 
or it can be also zero. So now we have to understand what does entropy production mean. See, there there have been a very nice understanding and of physical phenomena, and the understanding of physical phenomena is what led to this definition of entropy. Once you can define entropy, you find that it becomes very useful. Um, uh, this, 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 this property called entropy becomes very useful to understand the directionality of a process and to qualify the process as continuous or non-continuous, right? And uh, so that is very, very important. And this, that was very clever way uh, to define entropy uh, in addition to energy. Now think of this. Think of an example. So continuous process means it's a natural process. Now what I am trying to say, a natural process is irreversible. For example, let us think of a very simple process of a growth of a plant. So a plant grows into a tree. So you first uh, uh, plant a seed and you give water and nutrition uh, from sunlight and all comes. And then that seed starts, uh, um, so it's called germination process. And you have the seed and then the seed suddenly gives rise to a very small plant and then the small plant has some leaves and the plant continues to grow and finally it becomes a full grown tree and but the tree itself now if I think of a, the, the, the process in reverse that there is a, was a big tree and the tree is shrinking 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 down to the seed that is not going to happen however the, the seed going becoming bigger in the form of a very big tree, say for example, is a natural process. But if I have to take that big tree and convert it into a seed, then it has to be an unnatural process and how much of the energy or work that I have to put in, I really do not know. But we can measure it, we can definitely measure it. But what I am trying to say that in case of spontaneous processes or natural processes or irreversible processes, you, we do not have to supply any work. We do not have to do the, 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 we do not have to do work in the system for a spontaneous process taking place. Right? So that's that. So for example, water kept at 150 degrees Celsius in the oven will vaporize. So it is, it will continue to vaporize unless the surroundings are changed. If you change the surroundings in such a way that water starts condensing again, that is different issue. However, unless you change the surroundings, the process of evaporation of water that is kept at 150 Celsius at one atmosphere pressure rate inside an oven, right? The oven temperature is 150 Celsius. So if you do not change the surroundings enough, water is not going to condense at all and water is continuously going to vaporize. For again, think of another case. Balloon, you fill the balloon with air and then keep it in a refrigerator. Now, if you are keeping it in a refrigerator, you will start seeing, you are kept in a refrigerator, what happens? The temperature of the balloon and temperature of, the, of air inside the balloon, both are going down, right? So, the temperatures have decreased. Now, I take the balloon and keep it outside. So, as soon as I take it outside, the balloon expands. Now, it, it, it expands. Now, again, you bring it back to the refrigerator, it collapses. So, you change the, if you, if you do not change the surroundings, it will not going, it is not going to collapse. So, you can't tell that it's a reversible process. It's an irreversible process based on the surroundings that you have put in. So, for example, if you are putting the balloon in the refrigerator and then you are taking it out, it will expand. Now, that's actually that expansion is inevitable. It has to happen. Now, you again change surroundings, then it can contract, right, or collapse, right. So, that is, so, you can't say that since the balloon, um, uh, based on the surrounding, the balloon has contracted or balloon has expanded, therefore, it might be a reversible process. No, the balloon, the, the, the process is still irreversible. Only thing that you are doing is changing the surroundings. So, for us, so, the, so if I look at the second loss alternative statement, then one very good statement that comes in is for a given system and surroundings, there is a natural direction for any process. There is a natural direction for any process. 
whether the process is curdling of milk, cooking of rice, um, uh, uh, aging of humans, um, whatever it is, you will have a natural reaction for any process, right? Given a system to the surroundings, or whether it is heat flow, or whether it is mass flow. So, the spontaneity of the process, if you want to define, we keep uh, the system, it is fixed, surrounding is fixed for that system and surrounding. Uh, there is a natural reaction for any process. And as you can see, one of the uh, very important and very famous quotes is that entropy is basically time set, right? Now, what does spontaneous process mean? So, I will talk about, again, we have given several, several examples. So, I will give another, yet another example. So, if, why is this that one, one of the process in one direction is continuous in the other direction it is not because there is something called dissipation of it. Say for example, when you bounce a ball, the ball bounces on the floor, on a hard floor, the ball bounces, again bounces, but every time it is bouncing, it is bouncing to a lesser, lesser extent and finally at one point of time the ball stops and each bounce the ball is losing its energy. And it is losing its energy or dissipating its energy as it bounces, right? So that is one very, very important thing that we have to understand about entropy. Entropy basically is a manifestation of the dissipation of energy. For example, another example, if we throw a stone in a pond, so there is a, so when I am throwing a stone, I am imparting kinetic energy to the stone. Now the stone comes in contact of, uh, with the pond which is like steel, water is steel there. Immediately as soon as the, pond, uh, the stone is striking the pond surface, you will see that the kinetic energy of the stone basically is getting dispersed in the form of water waves, right? It will form and you will see these ripples that you will see. So for example, here you can see the ripples that are happening. So, you have a stone, you have thrown it here and then you can see the ripples. Now, think of the reverse process. All these ripples come together somehow and it concentrates all the energy here and the stone comes back to you. Now that is a mighty difficult process, it means not difficult, it looks, it's an impossibility, right? It is naturally impossible that direction. You can throw the stone and the stone's kinetic energy dissipates in the form of these water waves that form. Okay, initially the water was still and then you have these water waves, but these water waves coming back in, so water waves are coming, going out, right, they are going out in the, uh, this direction. Now think of these, this, these guys are coming in. That seems not possible and that is not possible, why? Because that is not a natural process. Unless you do some stuff, you do a lot of work. Uh, these ripples are not going to come in and concentrate. See, that point that I am trying to make is that they will concentrate at the center. Now, this concentrate at the center to create enough energy that your ball comes back to you or your stone comes back to you. That is not something that is going to happen, right? So, it, it is impossible. However, dissipation is like your energy is in some sense uh, getting dispersed um, into various possible um, states. So, instead of remaining concentrated, it is getting dispersed. So, it is spreading all over. So, that basically leads to, this dissipation leads to a positive entropy production. And this dissipation is the one that basically tells whether the process is reversible or irreversible, process is spontaneous or artificial. So, this is something, remember, entropy is a very interesting uh, subject and it is also for uh, material scientists because of this advent of this new class of materials which are high entropy materials. Again, there, have been, there is a renewed interest in understanding entropy, but entropy is something that has, that has always confused us and we have looked at it from very philosophical points of view, but I am not going to discuss philosophical points of view here. I am going to discuss if I know this definition of entropy, is it possible to use it in my scheme of things like un understanding all the sounding principles in the context of understanding the properties of man and that is what I am going to do. So, now we continue. So, we have system, 
we have system here, we have surroundings here and as you can see entropy transfer, how does it happen? It happens because there is a heat exchange or energy exchange between the system and surroundings and you see there is a delta S transfer that is happening towards the system and there is a delta S transfer that is happening towards the surroundings, right? So you have, now look at surroundings. Now if I just think of surroundings alone and again for whether it is system or whether it is surrounding, in all cases what we can do, we can divide the change in entropy into two parts, right? One is the entropy transfer part, another is the entropy production part. That together, so these two terms together is giving me delta S surroundings. Similarly for system I can write, this is delta S transfer for the system and this is delta S production for the system which gives you delta S. Now one thing you have to understand is this transfer business. So basically heat is exchanged, say for example heat is input. Uh, to the system from the surroundings or it is carried out from the system to the surroundings. In both cases what is happening is entropy is transferred because of all this energy exchange and as a result delta is transfer system and that's why I wrote this, drew this arrow that the delta is transfer system is negative of the delta is transfer in the surroundings. So that means delta is transfer system plus delta is transfer surroundings is equal to zero. So delta S universe which is equal to delta S system plus delta S surroundings is nothing but delta S production of the system and delta S production of the surroundings because the entropy transfer term that happens between the system and the surroundings, right? If entropy is transferred from say system to the surroundings, there is also an entropy transfer from the surroundings to the system. As a result, the delta S T terms uh, term goes to zero. So you have now delta S P. Uh, over the system and surroundings if I sum. Now if you have delta S P, you have delta S P system and you have delta S P surroundings. Now this, but this, as I told that uh, this delta S P is a production, right? It's an entropic production term which can either be, which in, in for natural, natural processes is going to be greater than zero and uh, for both system and surroundings, but it can also be equal to zero when the process is reversible. When the process is reversible, Delta S universe, delta S system uh, production equal to zero for a reversal process. That is occurring within the system. Now remember, if a reversal pro process is occurring within the system, it does not necessarily mean that there is a reversible process that is occurring within the surroundings also. However, what I am telling is if it is if it is reversal, then that is the only case when delta S production term is zero. Otherwise, delta S production terms are going to be greater than six. And that basically dictates or that basically describes the, the natural direction of the process for a given system and surface. So as I told again, I am rephrasing again, that for a reversible process, again that which can you can plot and the PV diagram of uh, our process that basically can be reversed and, um, and it will just retrace the path back and at every point of this reversal process, it's so slow, it's so infinite signal that every point the system is allowed, system and surroundings is allowed to take, um, to, to, to come to equilibrium. Right? Now, as you can see, for a reversal process, whether it is system, whether it is surroundings, delta S production is going to be zero. Right? So that's right. Now you have let us assume that delta Q rare. Okay, so we are writing delta Q reversal. So this is delta Q rare is nothing but delta Q reversal. And that is like the reversible heat input to a system, say for example, or heat absorbed by a system during an infinite simple step in a reversible process. And let the temperature of the system be T. Now, as you know, as you know very well, the delta Q rev is a path function, right? It's a 
if P is not an not an exact differential. Unlike state functions, it means the amount of Q input or amount of Q input to the system or amount of Q extracted from the system is going to be dependent on the path along which the heat was transferred, right? There are different ways to transfer heat uh, to the surroundings or to the system and it will now if delta Q reversible is a path function. That means you cannot express it as an exact differential and another thing it does not only totally depend on the it does not depend on the final and the initial states, it depends on how that the, to find out the integral of delta Q reversible to get the amount of Q absorbed or uh, amount of Q mm, uh, uh, input to the system or amount of Q uh, absorbed by the system, then basically in, in these cases we need to know what is the path along which this, this heat transfer has taken place. And when I talk about this dispersion of energy in the form, see one of the things is when I am throwing a stone there is a kinetic energy and then there is this water waves there and the final dispersion, the dispersion of energy that happens is in the form of, in general it is in the form of thermal energy, right or in the form of heat. Now, see a very interesting thing, delta Q reversible as you have seen is a path function, it is a, it's a function that depends on the path of the process. But T or temperature is a state function that also we need. Now, S we define as a state function. Now, S is defined in a very interesting way. Ds equals to delta Q rev by T. So, there is a greater than a del Ds is going to be equal to, exactly equal to because it is a reversible heat transfer. Delta Q reversible is the infinitesimal heat transfer in a reversible process. Otherwise, there will be an inequality, right? So, that I will come to, but see the point that ds equals to delta q uh, reversible by right? So, delta s, that is the macroscopic change, a measurable change, is equals to, you just have to take an integral from i to f, delta q rev by t. Now, if I would have written this, so for example, i to f and delta q rev is equal to q then this is completely wrong, this is utterly wrong, this is wrong. However, if I take initial and final step and I am writing delta Q rev by T and I am telling that this is nothing but, this is nothing but I to F T S where S is supposed to be a state function. Now we have to understand why is it that ds equals to this one where delta q rev definitely is a path function. Why is it that delta q rev by t is going to be ds or a state function? This basically this is a delta q rev by t itself is a measure of a state function and that state function is nothing but entropy. So, we will consider a very interesting process and these processes are called cyclic. Again, it is a cyclic process, we are not telling whether it is a reversible process, whether it is an irreversible process, but it is a cyclic process. What does cyclic mean? I start with initial, so that I have, you can see here clearly, you have an initial process. So, you start with this initial i, then you go to f, then you come back to i and that is like, so from i I go to f. From F, I come back to I, and that is basically a definition of a cyclic process. Now, in such a cyclic process, if I have to evaluate this integral, okay, this is a cyclic integral or the entire cycle. From that means it goes from I, it goes to F, then F to I. So this entire cyclic path, you are taught, uh, you are evaluating the integral. Then you will see. Delta Q reversible, if it is a reversible cyclic process, if the cyclic process is reversible, that is all parts can be represented by a PV on the PV diagram, then delta Q reversible by T 
is integral of the uh, uh, cyclic integral of ds and as we know that it is going to be so for example if i go from i to f the entropy change is sf minus s and then from f to i it is si minus s so you have two changes occurring one is from i so this is basically sf minus si is in change and then again you go from f to i si minus sf and as you can see if i add it the entropy change for this cyclic process is going to be zero right for an arbitrary cyclic process no matter the part this is basically going to be si minus s right? if i add them together it is going to be si minus s Right, it becomes a set, and so it is basically nothing but. If I write this way, it is basically nothing but S i minus S f plus S f minus, which is going to be equal to. Now we have to say formally why this. Delta Q raised by T is a state function. So for that we define a very interesting cycle, cyclic process, the Thorne cyclic process, which is called the Thorne cycle. Okay, and we are telling from A to B there is an isothermal expansion of volume. And from B to C, there is an adiabatic expansion of volume. From C to D, there is isothermal contraction of volume. And from D to A, it's a uh, adiabatic contraction of volume. And finally, you get an ABCD sign. A. C, D, C. Right? It's the same. Now, as I told, A to B is reversible as thermal expansion, temperature T and at the at for isothermal, right? It's a fixed temperature. Let us assume the temperature is 2H. Okay, and heat input is 2H. Now B to C is a reversible adiabatic expansion. If it is adiabatic, then temperature can drop from TH. So here it goes TH. So it is from TH, it has gone to TC. But what about Q? Q is going to be zero. There is no heat transfer, right? It's an adiabatic process. Now you go again, isothermal uh, com compression, right? Reversible isothermal compression at TC. So there is a this temperature. From C to D, the temperature is TC. It's an isotherm. With the temperature Tc, and then there is a heat released. This is something very important. The heat released is minus Qc, and finally from D to A, it's a re reversible adiabatic compression. Temperature increases again. So if it is compressed, uh, adiabatically compressed, the temperature increases from Tc to Tc, and you have completed the cycle. Now, if I just look at the entropy change according to the definition, let us assume that it is delta Q by T or Q by T. Uh, if that is so, then I will look at the entropy change. So here it is Q H by T H, here it is Q C by T C, A to B is Q H by T H, B to C is zero because it's adiabatic. So because it is adiabatic. And remember, this is isothermal. With temperature T, right? Hot. And then well, the CD isotherm is a temperature TC, right? Again, it's an isotherm with a different temperature TC. And so the entropy change in C, from C to D is QC by TC. Now, if you see E to A again, um, Q is going to be, means there is no Q, Q is going to be 0. And TC has now increased to T. You know, but if you look at the entropy change of this entire cycle, then what you find is that T 
this is nothing but ds in the, the cyclic integral of ds is nothing but image by image plus two space now as you know that for isothermal process you have delta u which is t plus w and since it is isothermal cv dt right delta u is basically cv delta t but delta t is zero because it's an isothermal process right delta u is equal to zero so qh is going to be equal to minus wh now what we tell reversible isothermal expansion so we can write wh equals to minus v a t v b d v and now again we can assume that in the chamber that is undergoing the cyclic process means the cyclic process is undergone by a ideal gas fitted with a piston say for example and uh, also the walls of this this, this, this chamber are well uh, for the, the are kept either at a fixed temperature and uh, 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 at th and there is also tc and for the adiabatic processes we are assuming that there is uh, we are not assuming we are enforcing that there is no heat transfer between the system and the surroundings right there is no heat transfer q is equal to zero now as you can see if i use pv plus so t this is something that i have been doing for quite some time and we are putting th th is your isothermal uh, temperature so it becomes minus nr th and then we okay therefore qh is nothing but qh is minus wh which is nr th and then we now again b2c is a adiabatic process so we be v t to the power chi into t equal to v c t to the v t to the power chi if remember this is one very interesting thing that you are saying v b into t h t power chi and v c into t c to the power chi now you will tell how is this happening uh, how how do you do that so basically <coughs> instead of writing it as in terms of pressure if you write in terms of temperature, then you will get this relation T F by T I to the power chi, chi is in by N R, which is equal to V I by V. Now you have for V to C one isotherm, uh, sorry, one adiabatic. So V to C is an adiabatic process. So it's an adiabatic process. And what is happening in V to C? You can have a look at that. V to C, you have a adiabatic expansion on the other hand when it goes from d to a d to a it is adiabatic pressure now you have adiabatic expansion you have adiabatic compression and you have now here when you did this you wrote vb VB is here, right? This is your VB and VB was at a temperature TH. VC was at a temperature TC. So you get VB TH to the power chi equal to VC TC to the power chi. As you can see, VI TI. So here it, is, it becomes VF TF to the power chi equals to. V i i v i i that's what I meant. Now similarly from D to A the same thing happens. Now what I am doing is I am multiplying this way. I am multiplying this term. I take this term and multiply with this term and I take this term and I multiply with this term. So in a crisscross way we are multiplying. So what we get is VAVC TH to the power chi is equal to chi and this VVVV TH to the is equal to chi or what you can write is VAVV VAVC equals to VVV VAVC so that's what we have written VAVC equals to VVV or VA by VB equal to VD by VC Now if you see QC is equal to minus WC that is again an isothermal process that's an Isothermal compression from VC it has come to VB. Now QC again the same formula. If I write and you are taking ideal gas 
I get N R T C L M B A by V. So Q C is minus N R T C L M B by V. So Q H by Q C. If I do so, I have N R T H. Q H is N R T H L M B B by V A. Uh, this is minus N R T C L M B B by V A, which is nothing but T H by T C with a minus sign. See, remember there is a minus sign and because so V Y L M B B by V A gets cancelled, so you have. N R N R gets cancelled, so you have only T H here and T C itself. Now, if you have that, as I told in Carnot kind of cycle, the cyclic integral of D S is Q H by T H plus T C by T C. Now, Q H by T H, according to this relation, Q H by T H is minus Q C by T C. So it is right Q Q H by Q C plus minus T H by T C so Q H. So if I take this guy. Here and Q H by T H and this guy Q H by T H and this guy here. So this becomes Q C by T C and there is a minus sign and this is Q H by T H, right? So Q C has been taken that way. So basically, you get you can easily see that you can do it and see that that minus Q C by T C plus Q C by T C is become zero. So definitely, for an ideal gas, we have proved. That indeed the cyclic integral of delta Q by T is going to be zero. So definitely we can see that uh, it has that means delta Q by T has to be a state function, right? Because it will depend only on the as as we told that S i minus S i the cyclic integral of D S is nothing but S i minus S i if S is a state function. Thus we are proving that the quantity delta Q by T remember uh, don't write it as D. Let us not be confused here. Delta Q raised by T is integral, the cyclic integral of D S, which is zero, and we told that we insisted that S has to be a state function. But we are also showing just based on this kind of cycle with ideal gas. But remember, there is one very small and interesting point here. We have proved that for a cyclic process, indeed, delta Q raised by T, the cyclic reversible cyclic process, delta Q raised by T, indeed, is zero. But for that proof, we used a substance which is an ideal gas. However, we should prove that entropy is a state function irrespective of whatever substance we are taking, right? And that is something we can we can look at. Another thing that I want to tell you that because of this cycle and these cyclists are sometimes used in, in are, are basically used in heat engines. Heat engines are made of these cycles, right? They make use of these cycles. To get the some work done, so as you can see here, then we can define something called an efficiency of an engine. So this is an efficiency of a heat engine. And that is nothing but work performed by heat absorption. Right? So it is mod of W, that is a work performed by heat absorption. Okay, so in the next class, we will go farther into it and we will try to see whether it is true for general substances that entropy is indeed a state function that we can prove and it is a very simple and easy proof. So, and uh, we will go from there in the next class. So, thank you, sir.